Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to this. I'm telling, well, really, I'm telling the story of a center in Vancouver, a psychiatric center called Hope Center. That's the, the long name is Greta and Robert H.N. Ho Psychiatry and Education Center, but we call it Hope. Um, and it was a building, one of the first in Canada to be built, purpose, purpose built for psychiatric use. Usually the psychiatric facilities are, you know, in the basement of the hospital or the old back hallways or something. I mean, they're never right up front for everyone to see. They're, they're an afterthought almost in healthcare. And so this was a change in direction to build a building that, that moved people out of a very old place that was dark and lots of beds to a room into a new building. And you know what was really exciting is that the, um, they did a, uh, some analysis of what happened to those same patients that actually physically moved from the old place into the new one when it was finished, and they needed 60% less intervention from healthcare providers just from being in a new building. Yeah. 
Exactly. The windows. Windows in every room. Privacy. Most rooms are a single bed. I mean, imagine if you're really ill. I don't even like sleeping in a bunkhouse best of times, except at a family reunion, maybe, and then it's fun. Yeah. Yeah, it changes who you are and how you behave, I think for sure. So that is this is the building that is the center of the storytelling. Uh, and I wanted to pick something that was newer like that. I didn't want to do, um, you know, pick one that had a certain segment of population. And like we have another uh, place here in Vancouver. They do really good work. This isn't about the care providers, but it services our downtown east side. So a lot of the people who go through there are drug and alcohol or addiction as well as mental illness. And that and that's quite common. But also I think it's easy for for the rest of us who don't have perhaps an addiction problem to say, oh, well, that's them. It has nothing to do with us. Those are different people. So I wanted to pick a place that was us, that had a variety of people just like you and me coming in to use it. And uh, that's what this place is, and that's the point I started at, is, is kind of ingratiating myself into the wards in, the, in this building and meeting patients and getting to know the care providers and the doctors and and uh, just started there, just started filming and seeing what would unfold in front of the camera lens. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Some people yes, some people no. But it, what was interesting to me is that it wasn't, in terms of people who wanted us there or didn't want us there, it wasn't any different in terms of the ratio of yes to no than it was in any other building I could have been embedded in. That was what was interesting. People did want me there who wanted to talk to me and wanted to tell their story and the people who didn't we just didn't do it we didn't I mean I was never forcing anyone to talk to me and I never put anyone on camera identifiable that didn't want to be on camera so it was for me just a constant reassuring the other people who didn't like us there it's okay we're not going to get in your way we're not going to get in the way of your of your treatment that's for sure and you will not be on TV unless you specifically ask to be on TV. So every day I did a lot of that because people come and go and, and people are ill. So they forget that you've said you're not going to put them on TV. And also you point a camera lens across a room. And even though I know we're getting a close-up shot of a person we're following on the other side of the room, it looks to everyone else in the room like they could be in it. So, you know, it's just constantly me being aware of what that looked like without knowing what filming is about. So that that was interesting to me and also yeah Yeah, we we definitely were and I would say there was good chunks of days we went in there that the patients went, "Oh, good, the film crew's here again." Because we're we're exciting, you know? It's not just the same old same old. There's something different happening. And truly there were people in there who wanted us to tell their stories. No one had ever asked before. I mean, yes, their care providers ask, but they ask with an, and for, rightly so, they ask with a specific agenda in mind. How is this person doing? Do their meds need adjusting? Are they well enough to be out in the community? They have that whole scenario running in the brains of the, of the nurses and social workers and all those people. But for us, we could just relax and listen. And for me, that was the real gift, to just drop off all the other stuff in my life, all the other stuff in the world, 
we didn't have cell phones on when we were in there. We didn't, you know, we were just there. And as long as we were present in there, we heard great stories. People wanted to, to have us listen, and that was very cool. Yes, exactly. I could if you wanted. <laughs> but but you yeah. Right. It, exactly. And you know so many people in all situations have stories to tell and some don't want to share and that's fine other than with their close friends or family. But in terms of people like most of the people I met had never been asked. They were they didn't have a voice. And so I tried to be as much as possible the conduit for whatever story they wanted to tell. I tried as much as possible not to judge around that story. It it's hard, you know. We come from a place where where my first instinct is, Well, why are you using drugs if you just about die? Why are you? Yeah, like just just get on with it. Don't do that anymore, you know. And and then it was it was really good for me for my development to see that people they're past that choice. They can't just say no. It's not. They need a lot of other help first and a lot of other things in place. So it was really good for me and for my small crew. There were usually just well, there were just three of us in there, uh, camera, sound, and myself to just be able to listen to people for what they were and hear hear what they had to say. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Well, for me, when you say that, I think of um, a particular person. I'd have to bring in, like, one of the people I follow, his name is Donald. He's, he's a young man. He's just in one episode. But to me, the way his health care worked was that it, the doctor and his family and the nurses and social workers and the um, community outreach people all worked together to try and get Donald better and back in his community so they were looking at what did he need does his family think he's better or is that just us hoping he's better let's talk to his mom and see if he's the Donald she remembers before the illness set in or or do we still have a way to go so you know it can't happen all the time and I know there'll be people listening that say the health care isn't doing that good a job but you know the people I met there were trying they were trying to look at each person and figure out what they needed in order to get better. And they were trying not to judge that person the same way I'm not. I tried not to judge. I mean, they really were trying to see behind the illness to who that person was and what they did. Yeah, period, period. And how can we help that person be the best person they can be? Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's what we all want, isn't it? I think so. I know. It's interesting because, you know, obviously when people uh, in the acute care ward at Hope Center, people were so far into their symptoms that it, it couldn't, a friend or a family member couldn't have helped them back. That's where I think you need to have that medical component because the, the doctors and nurses are trained and sometimes it takes a little intervention to get you back on the right track. But yes, ultimately, we all just want someone to care about who we are and how we can be in the world. Mm 
Yeah, I know. I know. That's okay. I. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> you know what? The word on the street is mostly fantastic. I mean, the patients themselves have, not all of them, but the ones who wanted to wrote back to me and said, I love this. I love the way you portrayed me. I love the story you were trying to tell. One man even said, we have a, a shot of him opening the blinds in his room, and he said, I saw that as a metaphor for letting the light in. And I went, that's great. <laughs> yeah, so the word on the street's been good so far, and I and I do like that. Yeah, it's making an impact. Yeah. I really cared most about making sure that the patients that we filmed and had in the film were happy with the way the story was told. Yeah, and then next... Yeah, exactly. And then next up, I really wanted to make sure that the, the staff, the care providers, and the doctor really really saw it as a valuable tool or a valuable experience for anyone else watching, and so far they have as well. So that's good. Everyone in the film is happy. And if other people outside the film are uncomfortable or, or you know, have problems then that's not so that's not such a bad thing like I don't think being uncomfortable watching for a while isn't is a bad thing I think we can't if we stay in that place where we're always comfortable we can never learn or expand ourselves so I think sometimes we have to feel uncomfortable in order to make a change in the way we think or the way we act that's just one of my little theories and that it certainly changed you asked me about what it was like for me being in there we went in. I don't know what I expected. I really wasn't afraid, but I guess I thought it was going to be difficult to get people to open up or to have any fun or I don't know. I just don't know. I didn't expect what I got, which is very first day. I got singing around a, a Christmas tree and someone easily describing his life, Richard, uh, making, you know, telling me stories about the wife he thinks he has in Africa. And, and I just... Um, and nothing happened the way I planned. I guess the really scary part for me as a director is that I like to plan things and I want to know going in who I'm going to talk to and not what they're going to say, but have some plan for the day because I'm paying a crew and we're there. And I nothing I planned ever went as planned, but I always... That's right, which I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so <laughs> my producer hat was going, wait a minute, you're paying a crew, you got to get something. But, uh, but always something happened, and almost always it was better than I could ever have even imagined because, as you say, I've never spent time in a psychiatric facility. So I, I really didn't know what was going to happen, and I really didn't know who would want to talk to us and what they would say. So every day was a learning experience for me. Every day there was one fellow who... Uh, right near the beginning, said, how come women dye the gray in their hair? I like that color. Why do they take it out? And, of course, I had my little gray root showing in the front, and I thought, hmm, you know what, Gary, that's a really good question. And I stopped I stopped dyeing my hair because <laughs> I thought, I don't like to do it anyway, and if you're noticing it, everyone's noticing it, you just have the guts to say it because the filter's not there right now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Okay. Well, I I think I I can't believe I'd find somebody who if I asked them who do you know that has is dealing with mental health in some way. If I can't believe there'd be a person that said I don't know anybody. I mean, if if you really talk about it, that's the thing is lots of people don't talk about it. So your friend you have that doesn't come out to parties for weeks on end and then all of a sudden shows up again and is the life of the party, well, I would say you have to, you you might want to talk to them and just ask how they're doing, what they're doing. So, yeah, definitely personal experience. I mean, my mom growing up had quite, got quite bad depression and she would spend 
weeks in bed, really. And I never, we never talked about, my dad never said, your mom's depressed. They had their own issues going on. And I was just a kid. But looking back on it, of course, that's what was happening. And if we talked about it in the family, it might have, it might have gone better for her, might have gone better for other members of the family later in life. I don't know. I also have a cousin whose son took his own life. And, you know, that was terrible in the family. But Again, nobody talks about it, really. It's sort of one of those things that just is there. And No, frankly, I don't think so. Now I have gone to my own counseling around this. You can imagine spending time in a psychiatric facility. I start to, you know, have my own obsessions about things. And one of the things I learned, of course, is that a lot of these illnesses are, they're not something you can bring on yourself. Well, most of them aren't something you bring on yourself. But they're also, I can't all of a sudden be schizophrenic, for example. But that doesn't mean that somewhere down the road I wouldn't have another mental health issue. Maybe I will get depressed when I age. Maybe, you know, who knows? There are some things that can can occur over time or in a different circumstance. So I like to think of it as a continuum. And, I, I mean, some days I feel down. Some days I feel okay. Some days my head is in the clouds and I can't keep a grip on my focus. You know, so where is that on the continuum? That's what we, we don't even think of it like that. We either say you're ill or you're not ill. And I don't think it's like that. I think as, if we're coping with life the way you and I are, perhaps we think that we're well. But then there's, I would argue that lots of the people I met that I would, they were ill, they cope with life in their own way. For, for one particular man, his name is Ross, just getting out of bed every morning and telling his brain that this is the real world and he can make real progress that day. If he can get up and do that and go out in the world and take a bus ride somewhere, even just that for him is a really good day. And why should we not value that? You know, why does he have to be an Olympic athlete or a, you know, a big writer or a, a speaker on a circuit somewhere? It doesn't have to be that. Just the fact that he gets up and has his life and enjoys some of it and talks to people, that's great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, yeah, to anyone, and not judging them from where you are in your life, but from where they are in their life, trying to see them at that point. So someone's success story is totally different than my success story. And the idea that we, yeah, you get me going on all kinds of things, but one of the things that really bothers me through this was this idea that we shouldn't be putting people on camera when they're ill, because we don't. It's a question within the medical community for sure, and uh, and and I would say more there. It, it, Q and A's it comes up as well, but you know people say, well, why why would you film someone when they're that sick? That's not fair to them. 
they shouldn't be, you know, we all have things that we don't want to show publicly. And never mind the fact that I had a very rigorous consent process so the people I am showing in their illness know what's happening. So that's their right to say yes. But I also believe that we can't understand what mental illness is and do more about it and be more compassionate and kind unless we see people when they're in their illness. Because if we only see people when they're better, we don't really get it. That that's what leads to us shutting them away, saying, Don't come out until don't come out of your room until you're ready to talk to me, you know? It sounds like we're punishing them. I think we're on a cusp. I think there's a lot happening in the in the mental health world. And uh, for sure, lots of the campaigns have, have brought it to public attention. I would just say that until I made this film, I can't think of a lot of times when I've seen people in their illness. And I think once people see that and understand and really get to know the per- I had one woman say to me, I, I, when I need to see your next episode, I'm really beginning to feel for these people. And I thought, that's great. That's exactly their people. And we should have compassion and kindness. And they're interesting. And we should care about what happens. I mean, obviously, we can't do that with every single person in the world. But you know what I mean. Of just in general, not dismissing someone because we don't get what they're into right now. Yes. <laughs> you know what? I am hopeful. Um, and that is a question that comes up a lot. In fact, that's where I get the most anger from people in the community that are attached to the health care sector. They, they say, well, where's the hope? No one is better at the end of the show no one it you know there's no you're not talking about any magic solutions my, my whole point is i think it's very complex and i'm not sure there are magic solutions but i am very hopeful I, i'm i'm a hopeful person you were correct but i also am hopeful that we can start to see people differently and i think my hope is that once we can do that they can get better care and we can help them be uh, live the life they want to live. If we're not trying to tell them they have to do it the way we do it, then they have a much better chance of success. And there lies the hope for me that each person can find a way of living their life the way they can handle it. I think that's so dangerous to polarize. Yeah, and and so I really do think that the less we can do us and them, the better off we are. And I my brain has really stopped seeing us and them as much as I used to. I'm sure I have a long way to go. And, and I was never a person who really was polarized from the beginning, but I've still moved. I've moved on that scale of us and them. And I see when people do things out on the street or whatever in a building I, I don't I don't see them as them I go hmm, wonder what that person's trying to accomplish it's more a wonder or an interest or a, a question as opposed to oh look at that idiot you know what I mean it's it's a different way of looking at the same situation and I'm not doing anything differently I'm not necessarily going over and helping that person or saying anything it's just that if we can live with each other with that level of comfort no matter what it is whether it's color of skin or language or mental stability or any of those things, I think all of us will be healthier. It's not just about them. It's about all of us. (laughs) I know. That's why I watch Star Trek. In the future, things look better. (laughs) 
And I really do think that we can, well, we have to believe we can get to a place where we can love each other more. If we don't believe that, I mean, that was the same thing with John Lennon and all those, Gandhi, think of all those leaders. They're saying we need to learn to live with each other and love each other. And if we can't, well, I don't know. That doesn't mean we can't try. I guess that's what I have to say. You've stumped me. I don't have an answer. I just think we have to keep believing we can do it. Right. nothing wrong with being idealistic if we're not then we end up i mean i i i have my own children are in their 30s now i hate to admit that but but them and their friends i see a lot of stress in their lives and a lot of uncertainty in the world for sure and if you don't get up every day and assume that we can make this a better place or you can live a good life in your own small community then what is the point of getting out of bed I mean, really. So I think we have to learn to be hopeful and we have to assume that we can make a difference in our own little circle. I can't change what's happening in England or in the States, but I can change my neighborhood. I can keep my family together. And that's really where we have to have the most hope, the most kindness. I agree. Definitely, I agree. Do you want to be in my community? Yeah, I was in. I shot at Hope Center for a year in production and for a few months in the year before. So, yeah, it was over a year. Um, I, you know what? I, hmm. <laughs> that's a hard question. I, I took a, for myself, I noticed what it was like when I wasn't paying attention to someone who was talking to me. And I think that's true everywhere. So I noticed if I was, if my mind wandered when someone was telling me what they wanted to tell me, the quality of the interaction and the quality of that story changed. They could sense that I wasn't paying attention or wasn't interested. And so I'd bring my focus back to them. And I've been able to carry that a bit better into my own life. We do it all the time. You know, we sit on the phone and, or on our phone and talk to someone and, with the other hand, we're typing an email and, you know, whatever, stirring my cookie batter. And um, and I think, you know, there's just so much going on. I think I learned that I need to be more focused in the moment when I'm with the people that I care about, more present with the people I care about, for sure. That's one big thing. Um, the other thing I learned about myself is that I really have trouble letting go of the people that I really care about in the film, the people I met in the film. I am a person, because I'm so hopeful, I thought that maybe I could have a diff- make a difference. And my difference, I've, I've come to learn that the difference I did make was having someone in their life that listened to them. But I can't fix the problems. I'm a fixer. I'm a doer. I'm one of those people. And I just... And so it was a real lesson to me to go, okay, that person 
is still going to go on whatever path they have. I haven't changed the path. I've listened to them along the way, and maybe if enough people listen to them, the path will slowly change. But I, I just had trouble with letting go at the end of the series. That's, that's something I learned. I'm sharing, okay? <laughs> yes. Or if I go and meet them enough after they get out, if I have enough coffees with them, or if I buy them enough clothes from the secondhand store so they can wear, you know, any of the number of things that we can do to help people who uh, have less than we do, it can help, but it's not going to change who they are immediately. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Knowledge.ca. It's very simple. One word. Knowledge.ca. <laughs> no. But you can Yes. Right. It does. Wouldn't that be great if if we could all just change a little bit each time we watch something like this? Uh, Right. No, that's true. Yeah, it if even if this just starts conversation, even if it's angry conversation at the first, that's a good thing. Talking is a good thing. Exchanging ideas, that's good. Well, I'm taking a bit of a, a well-earned break. My film be before these films was, um, I was produced one on uh, death and dying, and before that, another. I've just done a lot in the last three years, and I need a break. I guess that's where I'm going with it. So I don't have anything else right now that I'm doing. I have quite a few projects sort of in the wings, and when I heal a bit, I will get to them. Yes. Oh, I do. I love baking cookies, all kinds of cookies. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's been great talking to you.